period. Hi, my name is Irving Sobelman, and I'm on the steering committee of climate action now. And I had come and spoken to you some months ago about the public gas proposal, and at that time we were trying to get folks to contact the DPU about having a hearing out here, barring that, have the DPU ask some hard questions or advocate for us in some way. Really not a huge surprise that the DPU didn't take any steps, even though our state reps, our state senator, plenty of other people contacted them. But all of those comments that we put on the DPU docket did draw the attention of the Attorney General, whose office also got several phone calls and emails. And so they submitted a brief on the docket about Columbia Gas's um, five-year forecast and supply plan. And in my opinion, it's a really good brief. Um, it's a 12-page document with a lot of different recommendations and critiques of Columbia Gas in terms of their methods and assumptions and what they consider missing or inadequate information in Columbia Gas's submission. Um, so the Attorney General's office heard us anyway. And there are some limitations to their recommendations because I really, nobody's going to do everything I want. But, um, the, the recommendations that I thought were pretty amazing, they referenced Northampton a lot because it is the Northampton market is one of the components of this project. And so in one of their recommendations to the DPU, they say um, that the Attorney General's office recommends that the department require CMA, which is Columbia Gas, uh, to justify through public consultations with Northampton customers why additional gas resources are needed when the Northampton community appears to be moving toward 100% renewable energy. So they really honored what our community is working on, which I think was, was pretty good. And the way they laid it out specifically on their recommendation was that the DPU take no final action in the approval of new supply arrangements or infrastructure upgrades related to the Northampton market until the department can determine whether Northampton customers favor a renewable energy future or more natural gas infrastructure. I mean, personally, as a renewable advocate, I don't think I could have written that any better. So uh, I really appreciate it. You know, it's paying off some of the work that we did. We'll be continuing to work in a lot of areas. We've been coordinating with the mayor and with uh, Chris on some energy efficiency, on an energy efficiency initiative in the area. And we're working on some other things as well. And we'll absolutely keep you informed and would be happy to come in and do a more in-depth um, report. And we are going to be asking you for your assistance in the very near future, so you are forewarned. Um, again, I just feel really grateful to live in Northampton and uh, to have this commission working so clearly on behalf of our community to uh, help us end up with a little future. So thanks, and thanks for all your work to date and for what I know you will be continuing to do in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Sure. Thank you. I want to say thank you to I was lucky enough as uh, Irving was to uh, to be part of the community resiliency building workshops yesterday and the day before. And as a 40-year educator, I have attended a lot of workshops. And I think these were some of the you know absolutely best organized and thought out and, and I was I loved the diversity of viewpoints in my group and I saw some interest I made a, I think a significant connection and I saw other people within the group from very, who wouldn't run into each other make connections and so that overall I think there was a 
really worthwhile recommendations and plans, but even inside that overall good stuff, there was even more good stuff within the individual um, pods of the work group. So I just want to say thank you to, I know people in the room are responsible for choosing those facilitators and setting it up, and thank you very much. So we have two fellows who are visiting from Southeast Asia mm -hmm. who flew all the way from the Philippines and Thailand just to improve their carbon footprint and to watch what you all do. <laughs> so I just want to let them introduce themselves just briefly. So. You guys want to come up and say? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was afraid you wouldn't come from Philippines. Hello, I'm Jean Palmer from the Permanent of the Philippines and I'm an urban planner back home here to learn more about the better public spaces, which I hope to do after this function <laughs> for our metropolitan. Yes, okay. I'm fine from Thailand. Uh, now that I'm, I am a PhD student from uh, Thailand. And my background education is about environmental engineering. My research focus on the uh, phytoremediation. Yes, I love to learn with everyone. Yes, thank you. <laughs> We're flattered you flew all the way here for the for for this. <laughs> Sorry. No, no. They were, they sat in on our little circle group. Oh, good, good. They, that was more interesting. Than we're probably. Yeah. yeah. They might be here a little bit longer. Okay, I hope so. It's, yeah. They going to see the city council. Oh, going to the, going to city council meeting too. Wow, they're getting the golden tour. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, well, that's I think uh, is pretty fun when you have a uh, public comment period that they just praise us. <laughs> <laughs> this to cherish it, Chris. Right. <laughs> I'm glad you recorded it. <laughs> exactly. Right. <Yeah. laughs> I shouldn't say anything. We should have made it look normal. <laughs> um, uh, okay. Um, uh, I would. Uh, Accept a motion to approve the minutes of April 12th. So moved. And um, I'm going to actually open up for discussion. Actually, we have a second first. Second. Okay, actually. Okay. And uh, I'm going to open up for discussion because um, I left out a little blank on um, well, when I was kind of going over these, double checking them uh, from Doug's piece. Where we talked about climate resiliency and regeneration plan, we talked about it last week. Uh, useful process. Four top priorities were identified floods, drought, increased intensity of storms, and for the life of me, I couldn't remember the last one. He went. I just remember it. He it's basically increased heat. Um, yeah. <laughs> what would I have missed? <laughs> Global warming, increased heat. So, where that little space is, there will have, say, increased heat or increased, increased heat waves. Um, uh, is the last part. Uh, so if someone would, uh, I'd, I'll move them as amended. Uh, there you go. Approve as amended. Uh, do we have to approve the amendment first? Um, this seems more scrivener's error. Okay. Yeah. Very good. So. Okay. Approve as amended, and seconded as amended. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing. Okay. Great. Um, uh, so Denise uh, Lilo is supposed to be here. Um, I'm not sure why. Um, so I'm going to skip over uh, that uh, item at the moment and uh, Wayne, go right to you. Okay. okay. Um, I'm going to email Denise back here. So you heard a little bit about this already. So you know, we've been coming for you once a month just to keep you in the loop as the process goes forward. So the last two days we had our, our two-day workshops or stakeholder groups. The point of the stakeholder groups was sort of this is different than a normal public meeting process. It was to make sure we had lots of different you know, interests represented. So we were deliberately sort of stacking to make sure we had advocates for low-income housing, and we had building experts, and we had, you know, different different groups involved in the process. Um, and so it was, it, was, it was very successful. I think the um, issues of vulnerabilities, probably no big surprises to you all here. And the, this, this, the first day was about sort of what are the vulnerabilities, the second day was about, okay, what are the actions we can take? And so it was interesting sort of where this consensus and where this not consensus going forward. Um, I think 
half of you, a third of you participate in the process, so I, I apologize for repeating it for those of you who were, who were there. But just so you know the, the, the next stages. So um, we're beginning a draft report that basically just summarizes what we heard in the last two days. At some point within the next week, we'll work with them on that and get that to be a final report shortly thereafterwards. Um, the, uh, in June, still working on a date, in June we'll do a public listening session. So we get the focus groups, this is sort of much broader trying to get the entire community involved, particularly trying to figure out who wasn't at the meeting yesterday and trying to get them involved. Um, and then that process moves, so that's sort of this very strategic process, right? This brainstorming part about vulnerability. Um, but then we'll be beginning on this next I don't know, eight month, nine month process to create a comprehensive uh, climate resiliency and regeneration plan. So we will have some more public process for that. The meeting in June will be the last public meeting for the summer, because we try not to pick forums during the summer, so then they go back and they start working on their things and we can work public forums in the fall. Um, in an ideal world, we sort of build towards this big plan. At the end of the planning process, then we're going to start on redoing the comprehensive, sustainable and Hampton comprehensive plan, and so this becomes sort of a major influencer in the plan. The state um, seems to be serious about wanting to fund resiliency efforts. The state has a grant program that's due on May 18th. So while I'd like to say we, you know, we go through this big consensus process and complete the plan, and then we'll look for money, that's not actually true. We're going to apply for a grant next Friday because it's on the table, and we'll leave it on the table. And you know, there are millions and millions of dollars of things we could do. So we may not end up doing the thing that the community would say this is our top priority just because we have that limited information. But we know we do something that came out of yesterday's group that's really important and is useful. You know even if it's the third priority instead of the first priority in the process. So we will we'll be applying for that. It's a particularly good time because only 68 communities in the state got this first grant that we got, and so they're only eligible to apply for the next phase. It's gonna be like three communities and you know, housing choice in every other program the Commonwealth does. It will grow, communities will all sign up eventually, but we want to sort of apply for funds now while it's less competitive. Um, it's our job now to sort of take the comments we heard and think both about what are you know what are things that are most doable. Right? People are throwing out great ideas, some which are on every time horizon. What are the most doable? What helps build momentum in the process? What is clearly measurable goals? And then, frankly, what aligns well with the state's priorities? Goals. So, we'll be doing that in the next week. Yeah, will there be a report coming out, or will there, will there be something coming out that um, will kind of summarize the last few days? Yeah, that's in essence what this draft report is. The draft report isn't a lot of detail. They, okay. they may do some of the state's um, climate projections in there as well, but the interest, you know, the unique part is going to be what we heard in the last couple of years. Also, uh, do you know how many people, how many grant, uh, grants they will give out? The 68? They don't know. They're very clear that they, they don't know how many grants are coming in. They don't know what their process is. So, okay. I don't think they know any more than we do until they get the applications in. And um, I, I, let me just add one other thing. Sure. Yeah. Um, without giving anything away, you know, every administration since I've been here, it's been a lot of, you know, governors, sort of has their special point system. You know, things they really want to emphasize. <coughs> so we had Commonwealth Capital, which you all know, we were like the highest scoring. Com and each of those programs have often helped us with with grants. The new program now is something called Housing Choice, um, and this is how many new housing units are you creating. Um, with a less of an emphasis on affordable units, but how many housing and, and um, affordable units. Uh, they're announcing who was successful in the first round on Monday, and we are fully anticipating that we're going, you know, have announcing we've gotten in, we're fully anticipating we're going to be one of those communities. Again, it's not a grant program per se, but it gives you points and makes us more competitive. So of those 60 communities, I'm sure many, if not most, are not going to Housing choice communities. Um, housing choice is much easier to qualify for within the 128 corridor in Boston because it rewards a lot of building. And not surprisingly, all Western Mass is less building. So it's actually very controversial in Western Mass because we're going to be cut out, but Northampton is in right. right. No, that's fine. Yeah. Right. And, um, anybody else have questions? I've got a follow up one too, but I just want to open up. When did any of the 
youth commissioners show up, they all yep. express intent to show. show. Okay. Yep. We had we have a, uh, a Praxis student from Smith College who's starting, so she was our token young the person. Okay. <laughs> I had three members who were said they were signing up on the show. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, you know, we did ask people to start to commit to the two days, and that's a, that it's sense. also during MCAS and, uh, uh, right, right, yeah. and AP testing. Right. So, so they so may not have been able to. Right. right, that was during the school day. Yeah, yeah. But there were there were sites with the prospect of skipping school, so I was not enough incentive. Okay, um, and so the next next one coming up in June is going to be wide open to anybody. Yes. Yeah, this could be because one thing I did notice, although I and I, I want to repeat, I thought it was the, the workshops were really well done, were very informative. We had really good people there. Um, uh, so a lot of input, but I did notice that in our, you know, the two different, or the group that I was working with, I think there was one person who lived in Northampton. <laughs> um, uh, and I think that was the same, you know, there were a lot of people who work in Northampton, who know Northampton very well, and who have some expertise, so they were really valid. But um, I think there actually probably was a, a kind of a dark thing people actually live in. Yeah, yeah, and that's right. And you know, for, like for low-income individuals, we tried to say, um, we, we solicited, I think, four people who were active in things, we, and none of which came, and we had one person who was an advocate. So we had we had a voice representative that's still not a direct voice, right? Right. So, you know, right. Um, right. And I think that was the case in other places, too. Exactly. Right. Yeah. But, but also, I mean, to some that was still there, but we did want those regional voices. So, you know, yeah. Coke was there. I had no idea where the guy from Coke lives, but he was an important voice. Right. And, and he was. Amherst came. He was great, we, I'll yeah. tell you. Uh, so we had some UMass people, and but you, have, you have two hats, obviously. But, uh, but yeah, you're actually right. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, okay. And yeah, Denise is still not here. I'm actually wondering if she's forgot. <laughs> I do know that her students have wrapped up. So if she came today, she would be kind of giving us a, uh, uh, you know, the final view of where the survey came to, where they got to, where, they, where they got to, but her projects, her, her students' projects are now done. Um, but she did say she was going to be here. Uh, she, yesterday, she told me she, she'd see me here. Today. Right, right. Okay. Um, yeah, hopefully she's not. We're not going to sit here twiddling totally our thumbs waiting for her. Well, let me go on to the um, the intermunicipal uh, climate, uh, not climate, community choice aggregation task force. Again, just wanted to keep you guys um, up to date. Um, that so the task force has been formed. Uh, it met. On May 18th in Amherst, it's going to rotate between Amherst, Pelham, and Northampton. Is everybody on page where I April is that? Was, was that? April 18th. No. Uh, uh, yeah, April 18th. That's when it did meet. Okay. Yeah, that was, this is. I'm, I'm reporting back on the meeting that happened. Yeah, but you yeah. said May 18th. Oh, did I? Okay. Very good. I wrote down. I guess I said that. Actually, sorry, April 18th. <laughs> Okay, um, uh, and uh, just to kind of go over briefly, um, uh, Amherst is going to put together a one-page description of what this task force is. I did ask, I don't think you've got it put together yet, I would, well, I would have brought it, just uh, so we have something clearly stated. Um, we, they reviewed and, um, and prioritized a whole bunch of actions. Um, I guess I'll go through them real quickly. Consider this a brainstorm. So, but it gives you kind of a flavor of what they were looking at, what they're looking at. How do we pay startup costs? If we go into community charge, ag charge aggregation, there won't be money flowing right away, so we're going to need some kind of money to start the whole thing. Um, educating public officials, um, estimating potential benefits uh, via data analysis. Um, that, I think, came from uh, UMass Extension. Um, so they were interested in helping us out with data analysis. Do we use a broker? Uh, do we just go with consultant, make sure, try to identify what risks are involved, what is the legal structure for this agency that has to be between the three communities, um, uh, what consultants are we going to need to, to come to the, the information we need, create a business plan. Um, so by the time we're done, try to hand off to the towns at least an outline of a business plan or a whole business plan. Um, what budget is going to need for the task force itself? Task force is probably going to have to hire a few consultants to get a few things done. So how do we come come up with some money for that? Um, 
make sure everyone in the task force understands just the whole process to get to a community choice ag uh, uh, aggregation. Um, uh, confirm that this will work for using just the three towns that we have, that population. What are the pros and cons of broker versus non-broker? Um, when should we trigger part B of the law? The part B of the law is when you don't just take over the supply, you take over energy efficiency. So basically we will supersede mass save. I do want to be real clear that everybody is really clear that we can do additional energy efficiency and renewable outreach and stuff without going to plan B. So we don't have to make get rid of uh, mass save, but <coughs> explore when might we do that. Um, uh, what are the fundraising mechanism, mechanisms, uh, both for the task force itself and then for the initial implementation? <coughs> what are the legal options for the structure of this entity that has to you know, help the three towns move forward? Understand the regulatory environment. Um, what is the critical path to get to a decision? Um, how do we manage the funds? Um, and then from, community, from UMass Clean Energy Extension, uh, the USA identified based on energy data, what can we do? Some examples, actually I'm not going to go with examples, I don't understand the examples. <laughs> you want to answer from that. Um, what the task force is uh, working on now, uh, so by the next meeting, the members who are part of the Western Mass uh, Community Trace Aggregation Group are going to be uh, putting together um, a presentation and some discussion for the task force to understand the regulatory environment, the legal process, needed to establish this. They're going to be drafting a 12-month timeline showing critical paths, um, and they are identifying some potential funding sources. Um, and that'll be at the next meeting we start talking about that. So that's kind of an overview of where this task force is going. I uh, guys want to just keep moving forward. Any questions? I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, is there any kind of uh, <clears throat> memorandum of agreement between the three towns and city at this point, or is it more kind of informal? You know, that did come up. Why, why is that not in the minutes? Um, um, and you, I mean, at, the, at this point, the only memorandum of agreement there would be would be to have the task force. Right, because there's right. nothing fiduciary or anything. Right, and but the task force's job is to basically come up that with a recommendation. And then the task force at that point, one of the recommendations may be the task force continue to actually help the towns launch this. <coughs> but its its goal is really is just to get to that point where we report out, or we re report, and make a recommendation. Do we do this or we don't, and how, and how do we possibly do this? Um, so the task force will never necessarily even get to the point where we actually implement it. So the only memorandum of agreement would be for the three towns to form this task force. And um, let me bring that back to um, I do remember talking about it. I don't remember what we came to. It may be something to do with that, what Amherst is pulling together for that one paper. But uh, good question. Yes. And yeah. the only other thing I wanted to um, ask about is, I mean, I'm assuming with the expertise that you have in the room that you're not recreating wheels that have already been created by um, Cape Light compact and all the other mm -hmm. so I would imagine because a lot of the things that you brought up are things that you know have right. been tackled of course so I'm just wondering how much you're relying on that stuff well keep like I mean the first meeting what I what I read through this really was a brainstorming session you know I was really trying to get set the ground underneath us where are we what are we doing what do we have to, what do we have to do here um, um, and keep like compact is a different situation it, formed in a different regulatory environment, um, and it went through a different process. But with that said, I know that the task force actually is already planning on bringing someone from Cape Light Compact to speak to the task force. Um, so they're already communicating with them. Um, uh, so yes, I would assume a lot of the work is going to be done by the Western Mass group, um, you know, the staff members. Uh, a lot of the way the task force chose to, to proceed and, and try to work on things was, as things were developed, they would go up in a Google Doc um, form, and that staff members would be asked to weigh in, um, and you know, that would be the kind of conversation outside of meetings to prepare for something in a, in, in a meeting. Um, uh, 
So they're going to, you know, the Western Mass Group is going to be doing a lot of the bulk of the work with the towns kind of weighing in um, and giving guidance as the board is developed. Um, um, so where was I going with that? Um, why did I say that? <laughs> the Western Mass Group is different from the task force. Yes. The Western yes. Mass Group is, again, say again. Western Mass, their acronym. Um, w M A C C E stands for Western Mass. It's Western M A. <laughs> they put the a, they put the A in there too. <laughs> well, you need that vowel. Western, they did the vowel. I don't know. I still can't. Remember. What is that? It's <laughs> the next a working word. group of climate action now. It's one of our Very working. Oh, I'm is it on it? Is it all of climate action now? Yes. I thought it was part of that. Action now. The okay. It's a Western Mass Community Choice Energy. I think there's some people that are involved with Mothers Out Front, too. Okay. But oh, I didn't realize it was a whole subset of West. Okay. Well, it's a working group of, I think, of both Climate Action Now and Mothers Out Front. Right. Mothers Out Front works. But that's, that's a citizens group as opposed to this uh, um, right. task force that's been assigned by each community. It, right. you, it's the group that brought the resolution. Right. Right. Adele. And, yeah. Yeah, and and, uh, and they have the time. <laughs> they have the volunteer time to actually do the work. So. Um, Chris, can you stop? Yeah. It's just a gentleman around of understanding. Um, it might be worth, you know, uh, Susan Wright each year does the request for city council to approve intermunicipal agreements. Um, it might be worth this on about July 1st. It might be worth including this and that just so that if, it, if we ever find a grant, that we want to apply for on behalf of three towns that we have the authority from council. Mm -hmm. We know we often have a short time period for this. If we don't use it, it doesn't matter. Sounds like a great idea. All right. Mm -hmm. That's actually an excellent idea. We do do MOUs, um, regional MOUs, so that, that, yeah, that would give you uh, some solidity. So, right. Yeah. And that's, that, so it comes up before city council in July. It, it's pre fiscal year. I'm not sure if it's June or July. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because I I do know there is a grant being written right now um, uh, by another individual who is uh, someone named well I can't remember. Yeah. Someone uh, someone who worked out in, he actually supposedly was instrumental in getting the community choice aggregation law passed in Massachusetts, went out to California, right. did a lot of work on it out there, has now moved back and found living in the Cape, yeah. wants to actually live in the Valley, the current oh, house. Yeah. And he's um, currently working on a grant um, application uh, to the Bar Foundation. And that and they might use this as kind of a C example pilot test. So good point. We want to have something in place if we, if we need that. Um, I gave um, Sam Titleman a bunch of grant opportunities that I thought were kind of relevant. I mean, most of it's wonderful. fairly small seed money kind of grants, right. but if you can put a couple of those together, and if they're small seed grants, they're usually the applications are easier to. Right. Right. <clears throat> so if you ha he hasn't already shared that information, maybe ask Sam about that. <coughs> And to Wayne's point, the, having the council informator such as it is probably gives more legitimacy to the grant request, I would assume, just reinforcing. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Right. And it'd be nice to, the nature of an MOU, of course, is it requires other people viewing. <laughs> you know? So if we get one from Pelham and from Amherst, you know, if Amherst participates in the memorandum of understanding as does Pelham. That would help. Yes. So, as opposed to us just doing one, and right, right, only doing one side. Right. Well, very nicely, um, you know, solidly from North Hampton's point of view, that we don't have to follow open meeting law, for right. This, um, right? Because it's a task force on the mayor. You're not a public and, uh, body. And so, um, uh, that means I can very well just get this, get this, communicate this out to people right away. Yeah. Yeah. I'll get that out tomorrow. See if each town wants to uh, uh, get a memorandum of understanding there. Okay, any other questions on that? Thanks for the feedback. Um, and good timing. <laughs> <laughs> you want to? <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, I had some problems with my printer. 
So, um, first of all, I just want to um, tell you all how much it meant to my students to come and um, work with you this semester. Um, I got a lot of really positive feedback, <laughs> some of which I shared with um, Chris already. One student who said, I really thought I wanted to go into planning, and now I realize I don't. Ouch, <laughs> 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 Another one who said that she had never thought about it before and she thought she was going to do some conservation biology thing and really wanted to do planning now. So it went okay. both ways. Um, <laughs> Cancel it out. Yeah, right, right. But all of them really appreciated feeling like they were doing something real. And so um, I'm teaching this class next semester. So if there are other tasks that you think the students could help with, um, I'd be happy to hear about them because they did appreciate. Um, to interact with the real, the real world. <laughs> so, so that was great. So um, this being the end of the semester, I'm not sure I got everything straight that I was supposed to present for you today. But um, I know that we were, um, we wanted to see the numbers of target houses that were also conventional and split level, right? And so our original criteria were Houses with older systems, so no furnace permit since 1999. Um, the style was Cape Ranch. The fuel so, uh, was uh, oil, baseboard, electric, and then we added gas. And the system was steam or electric. So using those criteria, we got 429 households. And remember, they were kind of clustered in a few groups primarily. So if we take out the gas, uh, there were actually only 35 houses in those 429 that were on gas heat. So, um, uh, so there were 394 with a electric or oil, and then just 35 gas for total 429. So, uh, if we add the conventional or split level, we get a total of 1,019. So, a little more than doubles it. Um, and of those, um, only 295 were on gas. So I was kind of so surprised. So, um, uh, but again, these are no furnace permits since 1999. Awesome. Anyway, so um, this is very small print. I don't know why I printed like this. Um, so, so I, as I recall, there was a night something was floated last week about um, instead of looking at conventional or ranch, et cetera, but to look at it um, as, as post-World War II. Was that? Oh, we did do that, and I forgot to uh, okay. yeah, do that. Great. Okay. So post-World War II, right? Great. Yeah, so we did, um, it was between 1945 and 1985. That's right. right. That's right. right. So it wasn't just post, it was between those. Right, between 1945 and 1985. Baby boomer houses. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yes. Yeah. So I'll um, yeah, I'll pull those out. Okay. Because we already did that. And so the other thing was updating the survey, um, our um, that, um, and actually after the meeting yesterday, um, I kind of uh, was thinking that maybe we should do some additional <laughs> things with this. Um, well, I, I, what were we? But each was at the uh, resiliency. Workshops. Yeah. So and everybody knew what that was, what she was referring to. Then. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, and so, um, you know, this survey has been focusing on energy efficiency and moving people to um, you know, less carbon intensive ways of heating and cooling. And, um, you know, we talked about other, I don't know, right now I'm having a hard time identifying what some of those things were, but. Um, that uh, we might like information about households um, around the city, their uh, attitudes and concerns, um, um, partly around um, climate and um, uh, risks. Uh, so I don't know if that's if, it, if we're going to be bothering people if we want to, because we talked about developing some surveys, I think, in, at least in our group. And 
Uh, so if we're going to be bothering people, maybe it, is it better to just bother, bother them once for a long time, or is it too distracting because you know if they're focused on something like changing their heating system, then maybe they'll think about that or upgrading their energy efficiency. Maybe it's best to just focus on one thing instead of getting too confused. But at any rate, here's the one that focuses on energy efficiency, and so we made some changes after your comments last time. And I know uh, Martin Nathan is already out there piloting her survey. One thing that really did occur to me yesterday is, you know, initially I thought, okay, we'll mail them out, we'll, we got the addresses from whatever. We have the addresses, but the phone numbers were what we'd have to get, because I thought we'd mail them out, then call them, and set up a time to meet with them and do the survey with them. But I've been thinking about that, and I'm thinking, gosh, that's a lot of work, you know, going and finding phone numbers and blah, 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 and all that. So I think maybe just going door to door and just take, you know, then we can lead a survey if they're not there and maybe ask them to contact us if they're interested or say we'll be a get by again later and just sort of over repeated weekends do as many as we can. And really, if the numbers are, I mean, Marty's dealing with. Yeah, and so at least we only have, well, depending on what happens with our post-war, that should actually narrow the numbers if we keep it to 45 to 85, because right now we've got all age housing. So, you know, if we're looking at like 450 or 800,000, that's, that's a lot less. And so maybe we, we could just, you know, over a month during the summer of weekends, consecutive like weekends, just keep going back. So who would do that? Um, so I know you're talking about your students doing it. No, oh, no, 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 it's not going to be students. No. Students. no, it'll be mothers up front volunteers. Oh. Yeah, yeah. You know, one, I mean, one thing I think it would be important is if we could, in some fashion or another, check and, and validate the records that we have about whether the fuels are gas, oil, electric. Yeah, well, that's part of the idea. That's why in the survey we're asking them what kind of system they have and, you know, if they have a newer system. And um, so that's part of what we're going to hope that we can do for you guys is update your <laughs> record. Yeah. Can I pause there? Yes. I can dive in a little bit more? Because a request came in from Marty Nathan today. Actually, no, was it Marty or Lee? Um, saying that, you know, w when they started doing some sampling, um, of their survey, they started realizing that they're going to be going to some people who get, I've done it all. Um, uh, and so the survey is all it's going to provide for them is information. Um, and they immediately said, Well, how do we get that information back to the city? So I am, I told her I want to set up a time to talk with them and you and James um, because the data is going to either go into the assessor's database or your database and try to figure out a way to do that. So that's just kind of an aside. We're not going to do it now, here, probably. But Louis, that makes yeah, put me on the spot here in public. Does that make sense to kind of walk through how would we absorb information? Because it would be great to correct what we have. But well, I'm what the basis for for the permitting software, and so the basis for the databases that I use is the assessor's database, and I don't know what it would, and and it doesn't. On some levels, it doesn't make sense to, to update a, 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 a derived database because it's because every time you go back to the assessor, it's going to be wrong. So we have to try to figure out a way to, to update the assessor's database. That said, we could maybe pick a point in time, take a snapshot, um, you know, and work with something that I don't know potentially could get driven back to the assessor's database. Um, you know, there's so many variables, and uh, and you know, our our permitting software tracks back to 1998, I think, actually. But but over the years, the ways the permits have been recorded and the categories have changed, and a lot of it is in the narrative. You know, is just in the text description of what the permit was oh. for, and so it gets it gets complicated. Right. Um, but I think we have what we have. We have the assessor's database, and we have a list. And if we could 
um, get a sense of how many of those are, how, what's the accuracy? I mean, you're going to be taking the total sampling. Say we've got a thousand records. If we can, if we can sample a hundred of them and, and 99 are wrong, then, I mean, it gives us an idea. It's, and if 99 are right, then that gives right. us another perspective. Right. So, so I do have that data. And so we can print out just little selections of that data, like just the address and, and then the fuel type that's down and the permitting, you know, whether or not there was a permit. Well, none of these permits have permits because um, we're not looking at anybody who has had a permit since 1999. So then we could know, well, as we do the survey, the answers to those, and then that, you can have those, and then those should interface pretty easily, because there's an ID number, we can include that too, to the assessor's database, and, and that should be pretty easy. So what it, what it means is that at least we'll get the check that somebody's right. asking for, right. at a minimum, right. and then we can, and then since we have the data at that point, right. we can try to figure out if we can do some kind of a snapshot change to Update the anyway, that right. assumes that they would you know, <laughs> accept our, uh, <laughs> what people told us as actual data. But right. yeah, <laughs> I have a question about all of this, and I apologize because I missed the last two meetings, so maybe it's been talked about, and I would remember. But can you just so one of you remind me or us what the actual goal of this work is? Are we doing this so that we just have a baseline for the city? and an understanding of where households are at, or is there some other goal in mind? Let me start with a broader one, and then Denise, you give me a focus in on what Smith, your, your students were doing. And if this is too repetitive for other people, we can, I can I talk to you later. I think it's quick. So, um, you know, based on the assessor database and, and, and uh, Louis' um, you know, uh, the permit database, <coughs> we had this the fellow from UNH uh, through, or through the UNH program, um, kind of pull it all together into a big database and give us a dashboard so we can look at our community. And we are actively trying to use that as a way to target where we go, how do we approach people, our messaging, um, <clears throat> knowledge of where different technologies might fit for the different kinds of buildings, etc. cetera. Um, you know, it's really no other community that I know of has done this. And, uh, and it's kind of new. We're trying to pull in the expertise where we can and start using it. Um, ben has helped us by you know, going through the data and kind of told us that we could actually, it's not quite as clear as we hoped it would be um, because of some statistics. <laughs> um, uh, but the whole idea is we're not giving up on that. We're not giving up on the idea of, of oh, the data is not good enough, we can't use it. We want it, we're, keeping, we're continuing to try. Um, uh, to see if we can find it at some point, find a breakthrough, um, at some point find a way to uh, use it to help us promote energy efficiency, um, uh, you know, air source heat pumps, solar, et cetera. And <coughs> oh, was the last point? Um, um, oh, yes. Um, and, uh, and we highly suspect that the data has got errors in it. And so, of course, when you don't, and we don't even know how many errors there are in it. So just knowing how bad the data is would be useful. Uh, and that's where Denise's um, Smith students were planning on doing some survey type stuff, and it led into that, and helping us correct that, or at least identify that. Right, and the other angle was um, uh, after, well, during the Heat Smart program, and then afterward thinking, all right, which houses are we missing? And, and how do we target the parts of the community that aren't quite as well connected and might not hear about these programs. And so um, with my students, part of the focus of the class was looking at this really difficult problem of the existing housing stock that's, that's hard all over the world. I mean, we looked at you know how they're trying to approach it in Germany, how they're trying to approach it in Cambridge, how they're trying to approach it in California. And one of the issues was it's really hard for people, particularly people um, uh, at you know low and moderate income, who aren't used to having contractors come into their house, who aren't used to fixing something if it's not broken, and you know, and, and messaging has to be really tailored to those communities who um, have a 
different perspective maybe on you know, the whole energy, <laughs> home heating, cooling issues, right? And so, so that's what we worked on in the class, and so that's how we developed the survey, thinking, all right, how can we, you know, get information from people and give information to people who might not. You know, it just reminded me of one more point that um, I'm glad I remembered because I just slipped off my, off my mind. I went to a conference put on by Antioch New England uh, last week, and one of them was talking about micro-targeting. Um, uh, we're using big databases of people's, um, you, know, per, you know, purchasing preferences and stuff that they glean off of Facebook and every place else in order to come up with um, you know, very specific targets and, um, uh, and, and you know, specific messaging for very specific targets, right down to individuals. And I asked in that session, I said, well, you know, I work for a city. Obviously, I do not want to know anything about any individual. You know, that's kind of, that's just a, a line you don't want to cross as city government. But could you help develop that on a more of an aggregate basis, a neighborhood basis? or so, and the individual said yes, and it probably wouldn't cost that much money, it would, but there's some experts who do this, and you probably could. Um, so I'm gonna follow up with them uh, to explore this, be very careful that we don't, you know, push anybody's buttons about privacy or anything, but if it can give us more information on our neighborhoods, um, it might help us actually uh, communicate with them better about what we're trying to do. So that was a, an interesting piece that came out of that conference. This was mentioned. Any other questions for these? Feedback? I, I, I was delighted at the reports and the conversation the exchange. I'm sorry that we did discourage someone from considering who might have been considering planning at one point. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, the first, the first remark after the first meeting, <laughs> as we're walking out, the student says to me, Oh, it's so bored. <laughs> oh, no. well, this, is, this is as excited as we get. <laughs> We're very sober bored. <laughs> Denise, can you send us all the stuff, all the documents yes. by email? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, and, and I'll get the cleaned up version of what you Okay. Missing information. Okay. Thank you. Great. Um, we're done with the agenda. Early. Anybody want to add anything? I'll take a motion to adjourn. Nice day out there.